Vincent van Gogh's sunflowers are some of the most iconic works of art in the world. They are considered nowadays indeed a symbol of the artist himself. They've just caught people's imagination. Simple images, but the more you look at them, the more there is to see. These remarkable paintings are tied to one of the most legendary periods in art history, when Vincent lived and worked with Paul Gauguin in Arles in the south of France. He saw the south of France as this promised land. It'd be bright, it'd be vivid, it would be a whole new world for him. His interests were in color and he felt there'd be a different palette. He got a yellow house and he got fields full of sunflowers and very inky blue nights with very starry skies. He said, I'm gonna cover the house with sunflower paintings and I'm gonna put them all over Gauguin's room. The sunflowers would become a central part of Van Gogh's enduring legacy. But one of them would sadly be lost forever and another remains hidden away somewhere in the world. One was destroyed during the Second World War. The other was last displayed in 1948 and it's never been seen publicly since. The other five paintings have become so popular that they've reached record prices and traveled to all corners of the globe. Sunshine, a light which, for want of a better word, I can only call yellow. Pale, sulfur yellow, pale lemon, gold. How beautiful yellow is. Vincent van Gogh had only started a career as an artist in his late 20s. He moved to Paris to live with his brother Theo, an art dealer, in 1886. The Paris art scene had recently been swept away by the work of the Impressionists, but Vincent found little success or enjoyment in the city. His brother found him unbearable to be around at times, and it was agreed he should move down to the relative calm of Provence in the south. He had been in Paris, he spent the spell in London, and before that he was in Northern Europe. Young artists quite often rebel against old artists and, and establish new things, and in the case of the Impressionists, that was what had happened against academics, but then the new artists themselves become the establishment, thus leaving even younger artists to feel annoyed with them. And I think that Van Gogh felt trapped in Paris to an extent. We know for sure that he actually wanted to go to Marseille, so it was probably meant as simply an in-between. He wanted to go and set up a little artist colony somewhere. They were very in vogue in those days. And he thought, oh good, I'll go to Arles and set up a little post-impressionist commune. You do see a difference of when he moved to the south and this amazing colour, this vivid colour, that's just something that he was really seeking out. Whilst in Arles, Vincent hoped he would eventually be joined by Paul Gauguin, whom he'd befriended whilst they were both living in Paris. I realise already that Gauguin hopes for success. He couldn't do without Paris. He doesn't foresee the infinity of poverty. Well, we do not know exactly how good they knew each other. I mean, they met at 1887, they exchanged works of art. For Gogh had to give two pictures for one of uh, Gauguin. So that was the relationship between the two. It was obviously that Gauguin was considered higher in the hierarchy of uh, artists at the time. Gauguin had the bigger reputation, so he gave one little picture of Martinique and got two sunflowers back. Gauguin gave Van Gogh a landscape that he'd done in Martinique in the West Indies. And in return, Van Gogh gave him two still lifes of sunflowers. They were cut sunflowers lying on a table. And uh, in a way, those were precursors to the much greater works um, that Van Gogh did when he went south to Arles. Van Gogh saw him as a light-minded artist. And in that period of early 1888, Gauguin was looking to take himself into a more primitive world. He wanted to get away from, almost get away from culture and the restraint that, that put on his painting. Vincent would have to be persistent in order to convince Gauguin to join him down in Arles. Van Gogh rented the Yellow House in Arles, which was the building where he was living, in May. And there was a spare bedroom, so he immediately wanted to share it with a fellow artist from Paris, because he thought it would be nice to work together, life would be cheaper, and it would be stimulating working with a, another contemporary artist. So he invited Gauguin to come south. 
We know that Gauguin was a bit resistant and there was quite a few letters passing between them. So they're detailing how they're working, what they're up to. And I think Van Gogh was just desperate to get him to come there to be the start of his Studio of the South. Gauguin was a bit worried that Van Gogh might turn out to be rather a difficult housemate and he prevaricated for a while. But in the end, he came down to Arles. His ever attentive younger brother, Theo, who's an art dealer, actually bribed, I think, um, Gauguin to go and, and really be his companion as much as anything else by buying a, a work a month from him for 250 francs. So there were all sorts of reasons for Gauguin to go. But I believe that Gauguin will never give up the Battle of Paris. He has too much at heart and believes in a lasting success more than I do. It was while Vincent sat in hope of Gauguin's arrival that he began work on a series of sunflower paintings. He may have received the flowers themselves from a local gardener, Patience Escalier, whose portrait he'd recently completed. Van Gogh was looking for something to do in August. Um, the weather was wet, so he couldn't do the landscapes, which he loved to do. And he was hoping to do a portrait, but the sitter he had asked to come didn't show up. So he thought flower still lives would be the nice thing to do. And sunflowers were at their height. The sunflower is something that from quite early on was almost a little emblem for him. So when he first arrived in Paris, you see these renderings of Montmartre, which was then much more of a village with countryside around, and you see the sunflowers. They're not the main subject matter, but they're dotted around. There's a big difference between the sunflowers in Paris and the sunflowers in Arles, namely that the sunflowers in Arles are dying. And of course, if he wants to make uh, pictures that sell, you have to show flowers that are blossoming. He liked especially worn out subjects, so whether this means cottages or old women or uh, worn out, uh, so to say, um, sunflowers, that's the same kind of category. There's one theory that the sunflower symbolised devotion and loyalty, so it had this kind of symbolic nature already, but I think it really morphed into something that almost became like an extension of himself or a representation of him as an artist. Van Gogh would paint a fourth version against a yellow background that would become the most iconic painting of them all. To him, the sun and Provence and yellow all sort of came together in his mind. They are huge, dramatic flowers. I mean, they're large and they grow very, very tall, so they're very unusual and striking. They were also an interesting flower for him because of the interesting cycle that they have. They first of all turn towards the sun, they turn towards where the sun rises in the east, so fields of sunflowers all face the same direction. And then when they get older, they get brown and the seeds dry up and they go to seed. So in the still life paintings, if you look closely, you'll see the flowers are at different stages. Ideas for work are coming to me in abundance. I'm going like a painting locomotive. Paul Gauguin would finally arrive in Arles on the 23rd of October, 1888. He was impressed with the sunflower paintings that Van Gogh had made to decorate his room, saying that he preferred them to another painting of sunflowers by Claude Monet, done seven years earlier. But this attempt to create an artist's colony would not last long. We know that they were both quite inspired, and I, there were portraits painted, Gauguin painted Van Gogh. There's a picture of Van Gogh's chair and Gauguin's chair and they visited local museums, they referenced other art together, so they were working quite closely together. They were quite different in their techniques and their approaches, but they both found it stimulating to work side by side and to talk about art, and they spent a lot of hours in the bars and cafes in the evenings discussing the artists they liked and disliked. But they were both rather awkward characters, and uh, after a few weeks, tensions really developed. I think their differences in approach um, quickly came to the fore. Tremendously, stratospherically bad, yes, and um, culminating in, in the famous story of Gauguin going out for a walk, just thinking, I've got to get out of here, and hearing running feet and looking around and seeing Vincent sort of coming towards him with a strop razor, um, and just thinking, oh no, what have I done? Um, dear Theo. Paul Gauguin's stay in Arles would come to a sudden and shocking end when Vincent mutilated his own ear, 
during a psychotic episode. Well, we have Gauguin's story. Uh, he says that they had a disagreement and Gauguin said he was going to leave. And this uh, upset Van Gogh a great deal. Van Gogh supposedly charged at him with a knife, um, at which point Gauguin made a hasty retreat to Paris and got out. And that evening, he there's the famous story of Van Gogh cutting off part of his ear. He walked up the stairs to the bedroom and he pulled out his razor and he mutilated the lower part of his ear. Somehow he stopped the blood coming out and he put on his hat and walked across the square to the street that he called the street of the kind girls, where the brothels were. He presented the fragment of flesh wrapped up in paper um, to one of the girls. Of course, this was a terrible scandal. I mean, everyone talked about it. It was very unusual. It happened in one of the main squares in Arles. His neighbors all knew him as an artist, and of course, he then became the mad artist. Although his stay in Arles ended in such tragic fashion, Van Gogh had finally achieved his artistic breakthrough, and through his remarkable paintings, had claimed the sunflower as his own. After Van Gogh's death, this series of seven paintings would scatter across the world, with each one having a remarkable story of its own. In time, they would be at the epicenter of a truly remarkable legacy. The uglier, older, meaner, iller, poorer I get, the more I wish to take my revenge by doing brilliant colour, well arranged, resplendent. Vincent van Gogh died on July the 29th, 1890, seemingly destined to be a long forgotten artist. His brother Theo, his greatest supporter, died just six months later. It would be Theo's widow, Johanna Bonga, who made certain that van Gogh and the sunflowers would become the icons they are today. There was a small circle of connoisseurs, you could say, in modern art who really thought that he could become something. And Johanna Hochbongen, the wife of Theo, decided to take all the works with her to Paris. Johanna had started off a project of her own, namely presenting uh, Van Gogh in Holland and afterwards to Germany. And then very quickly, he became really, really famous. The main thing about Johanna was that she was tenacious. She stuck in there and Money that she got from sales, she used to finance and underwrite exhibitions. Then she published, I mean, a, a big moment in, in Van Gogh's reputation was when his letters were published in 1914, and then his letters to Theo, and vice versa. The letters in 1914, and that meant really the beginning of the popularity of Van Gogh abroad as well. The sunflower soon became a symbol of Van Gogh himself. One of the earliest exhibitions of his works featured a sunflower on the catalogue cover, created by another Dutch artist called Richard Roland Holst. Paul Gauguin would also paint a series of sunflower paintings himself, having left France and travelled to Tahiti. Gauguin loved Van Gogh's sunflowers and asked if he could have copies, and Van Gogh uh, rather generously uh, made two copies for Gauguin, but they were never delivered and we don't know why. They have become an emblem of him. There's something that he felt, and he said it himself, particularly drawn to. They were a manifestation of the way that he was feeling. So I think that's why they have taken on this kind of emblematic, almost signature status in his work. And why they've become so famous, why you see them on fridge magnets and tea towels, and they are, you know, very life-giving, bright image, but at the same time, they're a reflection of someone who has had a lot of torment and struggling. It's quite an interesting duality. A decoration in which harsh or broken yellows will burst against various blue backgrounds, from the palest Veronese to royal blue, framed with thin lathes painted in orange lead, sort of effect of stained glass windows of a Gothic church. Van Gogh had painted a series of cut sunflowers when he was living in Paris, and the flowers had featured in several other paintings. But it was the series of four sunflower works painted in Arles that would capture the hearts and minds of so many. Van Gogh would later paint three repetitions of the two versions that he had placed in Gauguin's room in Arles. 
As Van Gogh's reputation began to take off, these seven paintings would travel all across the world. It's an astonishing rise to fame. Van Gogh was unable to sell paintings during his lifetime. He began to be appreciated gradually to avant-garde art lovers in Paris in particular. It spread to England, it spread to Denmark uh, already, Norway even, uh, and then gradually it crossed the ocean to America. And then gradually throughout the 20th century, he's become more and more famous. It just seems it's endless. Also, Japan followed quite early on, simply because there were a lot of uh, uh, Japanese artists studying in, uh, in Paris. It would be one of the Sunflower series that would be the very first Van Gogh painting to make its way to Japan. This version of Six Sunflowers was purchased by Koyato Yamamoto, a Japanese businessman from the town of Ashia. But sadly, it would be lost forever, and for many decades, it was thought that any full-color reproductions of the painting simply didn't exist. That painting, unfortunately, was destroyed during the Second World War. On the day that Hiroshima was bombed, there was another bombing attack on a Shia where this painting was hanging and it was burnt. Whilst I was working on my book on the sunflowers, I tracked down a 1920s reproduction of the painting that was published um, in Japan. And it's a very rare reproduction. It's probably the only copy that survives in a museum dedicated to a Japanese writer. And uh, I asked if they could send a copy of the image. And when it arrived, I was astonished that the image had a red border around the sunflowers. And the museum had assumed that it was just added by the printer. But I looked at Van Gogh's letters, and he describes how he made a wooden frame painted orange to contrast with the blue background. So we now have a good image of what the painting actually looked like. And more importantly, we have an image of the way that Van Gogh wanted it presented, um, this wonderful blue-rich background with an orange border around it. One of the four original Arles Sunflowers paintings was acquired by the National Gallery in London from Johanna Bonga herself. Another original would make its way to Germany, where it resides today in Munich. It had first travelled to Berlin, though, when it caught the eye of Paul Cassira. Paul Cassira, who was this big dealer in Berlin, really introduced Vincent to a German audience. And I think the, the notion of the troubled genius was quite ingrained in the, in the German uh, soul, you know what I mean? And they, and they recognised something that was perhaps not entirely true. That was really the beginning of the Van Gogh liftoff. I think it's one of those things where they became perhaps one of the most iconic images collectively ever in the history of art, so they've become extremely coveted and they've ended up in different public collections all over the world. The very first of the Arl series, the Three Sunflowers painting, remains elusive. It's the only one of the surviving versions that's not located in a museum. It was first purchased by Octave Mirbeau in 1891 and may have been the very first painting of Van Gogh's purchased after his death. Since then, though, its movements and whereabouts have remained mysterious. The Three Sunflowers has only been shown once since the Second World War, in 1948 in Cleveland, Ohio, just for six weeks, and it's never been seen publicly since then. It now belongs to an extremely private individual collector who actually owns a handful of very important Van Gogh paintings. The three repetitions of the sunflowers that Van Gogh painted have their own remarkable story to tell. One was eventually purchased by Carol Tyson, an American artist and businessman from Philadelphia. And after his death, it would soon enter the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Another always stayed in the Van Gogh family and is now a centerpiece of the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. The third was acquired in 1894 by a friend of Paul Gauguin's, Emile Schuffenecker, one of the earliest collectors of Van Gogh's. Nearly a century later, the painting completely changed the art market when it sold for £25 million to a Japanese insurance company. It now takes pride of place at the Sompo Museum of Art in Tokyo. If Janine has the peony, Quast the hollyhock, I indeed before others have taken the sunflower.
Van Gogh's remarkable reputation and his fascinating period in Arles with another of the great post-impressionists, Paul Gauguin, remains completely intertwined with his series of sunflower paintings. Their iconic status is assured. I think his works are completely unique. They are so emotionally arresting. They are so vivid. And coupling that with what we know of his life through his writings and letters, it's incredibly intriguing and exposing. It's really getting down to the depths of, of a person. So he's sort of become this mythic artist. And I think it's quite rare that you have the depth of understanding of how someone was feeling, especially as someone with such extreme mental ill health and imbalance. It is just fascinating to look at the correspondence between what was happening in his life. And really, a lot of his most famous works come out of the times when he was suffering the most. Although he was a rebel, he subverted art from within. So although he tried to be anti-traditionalist, he painted landscapes, he painted flower paintings, but all the good flowers have been taken. You know, people have done sort of roses and <laughs> peonies and all that sort of stuff. And I think he thought he could claim the sunflower. You know, he said the sunflower is mine. Now they're so iconic, they're probably the most well-known works of art anywhere in the world.